Okay, um, so hopefully, thank you for inviting me, everybody. And today I'm going to tell you about glucocorticoid receptor and in invasive lobular breast carcinoma. So the glucocorticoid receptor has diverse and cell type specific type effects across almost all tissues in the body. Its potent anti-inflammatory properties have long been harnessed to quiet overactive inflammatory responses like those seen in asthma. In estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, our lab has described a uh, significantly positive correlation with relapse-free survival. Again, this is in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, lumping IDC with ILC uh, together. Mechanistically, IL's um, glucocorticoid receptor is a ligand activated transcription factor. Glucocorticoids like cortisol, which is naturally produced by the body, or dexamethasone, a synthetic agonist for GR, diffuse into the cell, bind the glucocorticoid receptor, activating it. GR then goes into the nucleus, binds DNA, transactivates or transrepresses genes controlling apoptosis, survival, inflammation, and proliferation. GR has a ligand binding domain with dexamethasone or any other ligand buried deep within the domain. You can barely see it in this crystal structure, uh, as well as a DNA binding domain bound to DNA here. In addition to cortisol and dexamethasone, selective GR modulators can bind the glucocorticoid receptor. These are synthetic compounds um, that have cell type specific modulation of GR activity. An example of one of the many compounds is relicorrelant. Um, and I bring these up because these compounds have been shown safe in phase one and phase two clinical trials. Uh, so this lends our studies of GR and ILC uh, some clinical uh, translational relevance. So back to breast cancer. In, in ER positive cells, I've shown you that GR gene expression correlates with improved relapse-free survival. And our lab went on to show a mechanism by which this might happen, where dexamethasone um, binds and activates GR. Then GR is able to bind a enhancer for the cyclin D1 um, gene which blocks estrogen receptor from activating that gene. And the end result is slowed cell proliferation. But you guys are all experts in ILC, and you know that IDC is quite biologically distinct from ILC. So the, our question became, are our findings relevant to ILC, and can we um, study that? So we began with basic GR protein expression in ILC, and we found the majority of ILC tumors express GR on the protein level via IHC. We were also struck by the, kind of the diversity in GR expression. So we have some tumors that are just blazingly uh, positive for GR and some that are utterly negative. From there, we moved to characterizing uh, GR gene expression encoded by the NR3C1 gene. Here we're comparing ductal and ILC tumors. Um, which express about the same amount of GR. We divided ILC tumors into GR high versus GR low and then plotted patient survival uh, in those two groups, finding a trend towards improved patient survival with increased GR expression. We noted that these two lines separate relatively early in the disease course, maybe indicating a, um, a delay in relapse or metastases. So with those preliminary data, we continued to ask the question, does GR contribute to ILC biology? And we focus on three specific hypotheses. In line with our studies on IDC, we asked, does GR activate, we hypothesize that GR activation will slow ILC proliferation in vitro, corresponding to slow tumor growth at the primary site. You all know that ILC tumors at the primary site have a really hallmark infiltrative growth pattern due to E. cadherin loss uh, and defective cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. This facilitates tumor cell detachment from the primary tumor site. We hypothesize that DR activation will increase cell-to-cell -cell adhesion at this primary site, therefore decreasing the tumor cell's ability to detach from that site and decreasing metastatic 
metas um, metastatic dissemination. Um, we also, uh, so once this tumor cell leaves this site, it goes through the bloodstream or the lymph, arrives at its metastatic um, site. Again, ILC has a hallmark metastatic organotrophism. The place we are interested in in our lab is the peritoneum, which is the sac that holds in your, your organs. Uh, this, this lining is composed of mesothelial cells coated by a non-stick hyaluronin coating and is supported by a basal lamina, including collagen, fibronectin, laminin. And we hypothesize that GR activation will decrease ILC tumor cells' ability to stick to this coating and therefore decrease metastases. So we have data to support our first hypothesis that GR activation will slow ILC cell line proliferation. Uh, here I am showing uh, some 44 actually lack endogenous GR expression. So I re-expressed it using a lentivirus uh, to have paired some 44 GR positive and GR negative cell line. And then I monitored their proliferation over time. We found that introducing GR into these cells decreases their proliferation relative to GR negative cells, and then activating that GR even further slowed their proliferation over time. When we perform similar assays in MM134 cells, which do express endogenous GR, um, and I've included some 44 GR that I've introduced GR as well, uh, we find, as you would expect, that, that adding estradiol to activate the estrogen receptor speeds proliferation, uh, mostly just to show my assay worked. Um, but then again, when we add dexamethasone to activate GR, uh, we see slowed proliferation. We have some preliminary data on adhesion. Um, so I've performed an adhesion assay to, to ask how ILC cells stick to an ECM coating. Uh, and I've used our SUM44 GR negative cells in green and compared them to GR positive cells in that does not, it's supposed to be purple, some dark color here. Um, we found that laminin had, that GR decreases adhesion to laminin and vitronectin. Interestingly, some 44 like to adhere to both fibular collagens and non-fibular collagens, uh, but GR seems to have a really variable effect on that adhesion when you introduce it into these cells. To follow up these studies, we've proposed two additional co-culture models to uh, assay cell adherence, cell to cell adhesion. So the mesothelial adherence assay where we plate uh, tumor cells onto a monolayer of mesothelial cells. So this should mimic in vitro in a dish, uh, the peritoneum. Uh, and then we can simply count assay how well the cells stick to these mesothelial cells. An additional assay is a mesothelial clearance assay where we plate a tumor spheroid clump of cells down on the mesothelial monolayer and then monitor how those cells can adhere to those mesothelial cells, disrupt their cell-to-cell -cell contacts, push them aside, and then adhere to the ECM underneath. So in summary, GR, our question is, does GR contribute to ILC biology? And I've shown you a trend towards improved ILC patient survival with high GR expression. That GR activation slows ILC proliferation in vitro. We're hoping to explore the mechanism underlying this slowed proliferation and whether ERGR uh, have any crosstalk in these particular cells. Uh, as well as I've shown you, GR decreases cell adhesion to laminin and vitronectin, and I've proposed two additional models to mimic cell-to-cell -cell adhesion in the peritoneum. I would like to thank my um, lab mates uh, and our collaborators, the RTA and Green Lab. Thank you to the LBCA for uh, believing in me and thank you all for listening. Pleasure to meet you all. My name is David. I am a uh, breast surgical oncologist at Women's College Hospital in Toronto, Ontario, where Canada, where I've also been completing a three-year postdoctoral fellowship, um, which is ending very soon because I've been recruited as an assistant professor of surgery starting July 1st. But I have to 
I'm immensely grateful to the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance for supporting the last year of my postdoctoral research um, in order to perform um, the research presented here. Um, I get to speed up a bit about the introduction because to this group there, there doesn't need to be a lot said about disparities in between ductal and lobular breast carcinoma. Um, although, despite the disparities, the treatment paradigms are very similar. Um, I highlight uh, one study that has come out of Ontario, Canada, using a, a population-based database that I've used for this study um, that shows that the incidence of lobular breast cancer is increasing, but we saw that long-term there was worse survival in patients that were uh, between the ages of 18 to 59. So one of the tools we have in the province of Ontario is that we have um, an institute for clinical evaluative sciences that collects um, healthcare administrative data sets on the population of 15 million people in Ontario. And every time they interact with the healthcare system, that information is collected. And it's in the form of these data sets. So the Ontario Cancer Registry collects all cancer diagnoses and is pretty accurate, containing about 96% of diagnoses. Um, the uh, discharge database collects information on inpatient admissions. The activity level report captures uh, treatments on chemotherapy and radiation therapy. We're able to capture what type of chemo they received, whether it was a neoadjuvant or adjuvant intent, for example, how many radiation fractions they received. Um, we're able to collect inf socio-demographic information. Um, anytime they use a healthcare service, we're, we're able to collect billings and to look back on those. And we're also able to capture information on the actual physicians treating these patients through the physician's database. And these are all linked. So these data sets are very powerful and can be used to assess a variety of uh, any medical question. And so that was the proposal was to study invasive lobular cancer uh, with this database. So some of the questions I wanted to, um, hopefully, hopefully it shrinks down. <laughs> One was to calculate annual incidence rates and to determine the 5, 10, 15, and 20 year survival for invasive lobular and mixed as compared with invasive ductal. Um, I have a particular interest in mixed patients because having my own patients in clinical practice, I find they're often challenging in and of, them, in and of themselves. Um, in terms of methods, the survival will be com uh, compared using the log rank test and stratified by age group stage and receptor status. The second question I want to look at was whether there were patient factors, tumor factors, and treatment factors that could predict survival, and this would be through a multivariable Cox proportional hazards regression analysis. Of course, as a surgeon, I'm always interested in the impact of different surgical procedures, um, and of course, the role of axillary surgery. And the way that the province of Ontario, the way that cancer care is divided is that it is divided into 14 zones or local health integration networks that we call LIN. And it, in theory, it doesn't matter where you live on, in Ontario, but cancer care is standardized so that everyone, it doesn't matter whether you live in a rural area in the north or whether you're in downtown Toronto, you would be getting the exact same care. But we're able to capture um, information on these 14 different zones. So I was interested to see if there was difference in survival, in survival as well as treatment variations between the different LINs. Um, whether there was difference in management, uh, were uh, use of chemotherapy, radiation therapy, for example. Um, one can also determine whether there's differences in treatment patterns between providers. Um, so this is um, in a question that I was interested to look at. And whether these factors would impact survival. Now they asked me to talk about the role of the patient advocate in uh, putting this proposal together, which I think is really important. Um, it was a very, um, it was my first time working with a patient advocate. Um, and of course involved meeting with the advocate, reviewing the proposal together. And it was a very uh, mutual and beneficial contribution because she um, had a lot of questions such as looking at recurrence. Um, she even contributed a lot of the references that I submitted on my application. And now she's part of the analysis team. Um, of course, I thank, again, the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance. Um, I actually connected through them, and it was them that had connected me with the patient advocate. I didn't actually know where to find them. So I think it's important to get this information out um, um, and to kind of lead the way for the future researchers. Um, and now getting to the results. So 
looking back from 1990 to 2020, in the province of Ontario, there are about 240, 100,000 um, breast cancer cases, 81% of which, or here's the breakdown, 81% of which were ductal. Um, 8% are about almost 20,000 or 19,000 were lobular, and then um, 10,000 were mixed ductal lobular. And I, again, I chose to separate out the lobular and the mixed lobular. The previous study had, had combined them together. I'm, I'm particularly interested to see if there is differences between the two. And then the other subsets are, the other types include the mucinous and the adenoid cystics that I just uh, left them out of the analysis. Now, when we look at crude incidence rates, first we see that this was done um, by taking the raw incidence and dividing it by the population at risk, which is the number of women over the age of 18 living in the province of Ontario. And we see that the, um, the incidence of ductal is rising over time, over the time periods. Now, when we compare this to lobular and mixed, I found interesting findings. Um, I see that there is an increase in the crude incidence rates in lobular. Um, interestingly, there is, after 2009 period, there's about a, a, there was an increase in the mixed, but now there's an, a decrease. And, and I can't blame it on um, hospitals not submitting their data because, again, we capture all the diagnoses. So um, that will be hypothesis generating, I'm sure. These were the uh, Kaplan-Meier survival curves comparing the three subtypes. Um, and. And what we see here, this was significant. Um, I think by the sheer number of patients, every all this, um, all the subgroup analyses were significant. But what we see that is that after 10 years, the bottom line is the invasive lobular carcinoma group, and we see that they have inferior outcomes compared to both the ductal and the mix. And it's interesting that the mix group, their survival is similar to the ductal. So I wonder if their survival or tr b clinical behavior is similar to that of ductal. In my Cox regression analysis, looking at um, uh, the different factors that may predict survival, so, so there's some variables that were available as early as 1990, so we have a more complete data set. So when we look at those variables that were available up to uh, going as far back as nine, 1990, we see that um, age was a significant predictor, but more so the older age group. Um, compared to age 50 to 54, there was um, a dose-dependent increase in the hazard ratio. We're able to look at income quintile um, in Ontario, and interestingly, um, this kind of mirrors the disparities that we see with invasive ductal carcinoma. The lowest quintile have worse survival, and the highest quintile have improved survival, and this again may relate to access uh, to care. This was looking at the 14 different LINs in Ontario, and it was very interesting to see that um, in terms of rural status, um, there was no difference overall, but we found that depending on where you lived in Ontario, there were certain regions where women with invasive lobular carcinoma had worse survival, um, particularly in uh, kind of in this, in what we call the green belt or industrial region um, in comparison to the more central regions um, like Toronto. Uh, this is the comorbidity index score that is calculated and captured in ISIS, and we see that there's a dose-dependent response with each increase in score of the comorbidity index. And this was a, another interesting finding. One of the healthcare services used that we capture is how many times a woman has had a mammogram. And we see that even though invasive lobular is hard to detect on mammogram, women who stick to getting their annual mammograms actually have better improved survival, especially if they're able to stick with getting their yearly mammogram, which is very interesting. When it comes to stage data, the stage data was only start, it, it, it only started to be collected by the OCR in 2004. Um, so that's why there's um, missing data, not because it was not collected, but, or missing, but because it just wasn't collected prior to 2004. But this is the distribution of the lobular group in terms of stage, um, grade, um, receptor status and HER2 status. Um, this I just added just to see whether there was a change in stage um, over time. Um, and, and what I found interesting in this data was that um, over, over time, it seems that there is more stage ones being detected. 
um, and less stage threes, um, which is a bit in contrast to, I think, what we saw from an earlier study. And I, I wonder if that's from earlier awareness, better detection. And another question I want to look at was whether there was a difference in survival between the different stages. And we said there was no uh, significance between the three types when we look at stage one and stage two, nor in the metastatic group. But in the stage three, the, lo the locally advanced is where we see the worst survival in the invasive lobular. And I think this goes with Dr. Metzger's um, remark with that there's a subset in the more locally advanced lobulars who may benefit from systemic therapy. Um, and I'll, I'll be able to look back at this and see what treatments they've had um, because that's all captured and it'll be interesting to see. Um, and then when we include this in the Cox regression analysis, of course, we're only limited to those who had this data available, but we saw that um, increasing stage in grade three, ER negativity and PR negativity was uh, a predictor of survival. The next few slides I'd added in the mixed group as well, but um, just for the sickness of time, most of the factors were, we saw very similar trends in the um, mixed group as well. Although I didn't, I didn't see as much with, um, so with the quintile, quintile level, and that may relate to the actual um, number. There's less mixed patients. Um, again, there's, there may some, be some differences depending on where you're treated in Ontario. Um, this is comorbidity index. This is, again, number of mammograms. And then, of course, very similar findings with um, clinical pathologic details. So then going forward, I've only presented some of the data for the sakeness of time, but we're planning to finalize the first two aims and submit it to San Antonio. Um, this is going to be, um, the surgical talk will be presented at, uh, submitted to SSO or the American Society of Breast Surgeons, and I was going to present the differences between where you're treating Ontario at and submit to ASCO. Um, so to summarize the preliminary findings, the crude incidence of ILC seems to be increasing over time, whereas interestingly in this data set, the incidence of mix is decreasing. Um, over a 30-year follow-up period, um, the lobular patients had worse survival compared to IDC in the mix, particularly when we're looking at stage three patients. Um, and then predictors of survival included older age, uh, lowest income quartile, where you lived in Ontario, comorbidity index, number of mammograms received, and of course the um, clinical pathologic um, variables that are in line with what others have presented. So again, I really have to thank the Invasive, uh, the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance for supporting um, my research over the last year. Uh, so indeed, I am uh, Karen. I am. Uh, I have a clinical background of uh, gynecology and obstetrics, and I'm currently a PhD candidate in the lab of uh, Christine Desmet. And I will talk today about enhancing research on metastatic lobular breast cancer through a post-mortem tissue donation study. Um, so this is the outline. I will start with some background. Uh, then we'll move on to how uh, we set up our project. I will show some first results and then go over to the future perspectives and conclusions. So first the background. Allow me to talk first a bit about breast cancer in general. Um, so 6% of newly diagnosed breast cancers are metastatic. And 20 to 30% of patients initially treated with curative intent will develop breast cancer metastasis at a later stage. Um, and then if we look at lobular breast cancer, we know that it has a wider metastatic spread. It can spread also to the stomach, to the um, GI tract, to the uterus and ovaries, to the eye socket, as we've seen earlier. And also, dormancy is of great importance for ILC. We know that ILC relapses later, um, and so yeah, we need to um, look into dormancy uh, in the future much more as well. We also know that breast cancer is a very heterogeneous uh, disease, not only between patients, but also within one patient, between the different lesions within a patient, and also inside one lesion, uh, multiple clones can uh, exist. But nonetheless, treatments are still mainly tailored to the characteristics of the primary tumor. 
so far, metastatic research is mostly based on um, samples collected in the context of clinical trials, uh, some institutional initiatives, some patient partner research, as well as international um, screening programs like Aurora. But we need to um, be aware that this is a biased representation, um, since only accessible metastases are represented. And small size biopsies might not be representative for the entire metastasis. And uh, the comparison between primary tumor and metastatic lesions is quite rare. And we believe that post-mortem tissue donation programs can overcome some of these issues, although some new issues arise with uh, post-mortem tissue donation programs. So what have we done in Leuven? We have set up the UPTIDER program. UPTIDER stands for UZKU Leuven Program for Postmortem Tissue Donation to Enhance Research. And we want to unravel metastatic breast cancer evolution, biology, heterogeneity, and treatment resistance. We are allowing all patients with stage four breast cancer to be included, with the exception of patients that have a transmittable disease that, that can uh, put the researchers at risk. The program is divided in uh, several sub-studies. So we first did a pilot phase to assess the feasibility. Um, we, are in, uh, we have um, several sub-studies on rare subtypes, blubber breast cancer being one of them. And we have specific research questions uh, which we will assess in every each of these uh, for uh, each of these subtypes. So the patient um, that are willing to participate, the, they sign all the legal documents necessary. They sign the informed consent, and then we start collecting the clinical data of these patients. Um, we collect everything on the uh, imaging part, on um, which lesions responded to which uh, treatments. Um, we uh, collect every treatment that the patient has uh, gotten. We also start uh, planning what we need to do uh, during autopsy. So we take the last scans to see where the lesions are located so that we can um, move on more quickly during the autopsy. We do also a sampling of liquid biopsies at inclusion, and we start collecting uh, the historical and clinical samples that we're taking during the course of life of the patient. Then when the patient uh, passes away, we are notified. We are on call 24-7. The patient is uh, transported to UZ Leuven, and if possible, if the um, time between uh, the patient passing away and the start of the autopsy is not too long. And if we have access to the MRI, we uh, also perform an uh, MRI to guide the tissue donation, but also to perform radiomics. Then the tissue donation starts, and we collect first um, all uh, kinds of liquid biopsies to assess uh, ctDNA, uh, circulating tumor cells, to do lipidomics, metabolomics. And then for the solid samples, we take mirrored sampling. Um, so from each lesion, we take several uh, pieces um, to do uh, several uh, uh, analysis on. Um, we have also samples that go to uh, collaborators. We also take some healthy tissue samples for validation and also take samples from um, parts of the body that were irradiated, that uh, so were actually locally treated. Uh, for breast cancer. It is a huge effort. Um, so the entire team uh, is involved, but uh, of course that's not enough. We need a lot of collaboration from inside the clinic. Uh, a lot of uh, departments from the clinic are involved. Also a lot of other labs within KU Leuven are involved, as well as many external collaborators. And here I would like to highlight, especially for the lobular uh, breast cancer, the labs of, uh, um, so Briskin lab uh, for the um, PDX models, and then the lab of Patrick Dirksen for the organoids. Then some first results. So far, in total, we have included 21 patients. Nine of them were um, diagnosed with lobular breast cancer, so five with pure lobular breast cancer, and four had mixed 
lobular breast cancer with non-special type breast cancer. We have performed an autopsy on six of uh, these patients, three pure, three mixed. And two of these patients with mixed ILC NST were not known to have ILC prior to the autopsy. So it was discovered at the um, uh, histopathological findings of the autopsy that it was in fact also lobular. And then looking back to the primary tumor, there was already some part of the lesion that was uh, also a lobular breast cancer. And we are also expecting additional uh, samples uh, from the collaboration with uh, Steffi and uh, Adrian. Um, and so in the table here you can see um, the, from the six patients uh, that uh, we have performed the autopsy on that it takes a lot of time to do the autopsy, uh, that we can sample a lot of lesions. So it depends a bit on the tumoral burden within uh, each patient, but it uh, can go up to, to 61 lesions. We take a lot of samples, so we are able to collect on average uh, more than 100 samples per patient. And we also take a lot of liquid samples. And what we see macroscopically during autopsy um, is not always represented in what we see under the microscope. So ILC is an underestimated disease burden. Um, we sometimes have livers that macroscopically look perfectly normal. On radiology, um, there was never anything mentioned. But if we then look under the microscope, or if Maxime then looks under the microscope, uh, we see that, uh, in fact, the tissue is full of lobular uh, cancer cells. Also for the stomach, in some of these patients, the stomach was a bit harder, but we actually macroscopically didn't really see much. But then under the microscope, it was, again, full of uh, lobular breast cancer cells. And then there was one patient who had some small deposits on the outside of the, the heart. Uh, we sampled that as well. And indeed, those deposits were also lobular breast cancer. But in fact, it was also a tumoral invasion inside the muscle of the heart. But bear in mind, these are patients that were, that were having a large tumoral burden at the end stage of, uh, of life, having a lot of uh, treatment. So, I can't make any real conclusions, but I'm not expecting this to happen already uh, early stage in uh, metastatic lobular breast cancer. Then that was it for the results for now. I'm not bringing much data at this point, but uh, I promise you the data is, uh, is coming. Um, we are planning to do a histopathological characterization of all the lesions. It's already up and, uh, and running. Um, to assess also the disease heterogeneity, to do a phylogenetic reconstruction of all the lesions. The experimental models um, is also very promising at this point. Um, so we're working together with uh, Briskin Lab uh, and uh, Giorgio has uh, ensured us that some of uh, the lesions and especially the fluids are looking promising. So uh, we're expecting new uh, ILC models uh, from those samples. Um, we are assessing the um, liquid biopsies. We are evaluating treatment resistance, looking into tumor microenvironment, radiomics, metabolomics, and we hope to be able to find new treatment targets. So in conclusion, metastatic ILC is greatly understudied. Metastatic disease is very heterogeneous and in vivo sampling is limited. And we hope that uptiter can be part of the solution. And in six patients, we have already collected more than 700 samples of solid metastatic tissue. If we also um, look to the liquids and to the normal samples, we have over 2,000 samples only from six patients. So. That was uh, it for now. Um, I would like to thank um, yeah, the entire lab, uh, especially Christine Smet and Giuseppe Flores, who are the PI of uh, um, this trial. Um, 
every one of the lab has uh, put in a lot of effort. Uh, so Marion, Maxime, Francois, who are all here, and also the others. Uh, it's been a tremendous work uh, that they've done. I also especially like to thank Maxime and Tatiana uh, Jürgens for uh, providing some material for uh, these slides. I also like to thank all the collaborators inside uh, KU Leuven and also outside of uh, KU Leuven. And we especially want to thank all the patients and their families for uh, accepting to uh, be included in uh, this, uh, um, this study. We know that it's not an easy choice to make to donate your body um, to, uh, to us. Uh, and of course, last but not least, I would uh, like to thank Labor Breast Cancer Alliance and Conquer Cancer uh, Foundation for supporting the ILC sub-study of uh, Uptider. And of course, I also want to thank the uh, patient advocates of ELBCC for supporting me during uh, the grant proposal. Thank you. <laughs>